Kansas history reflects American ideals. Often, Kansas has been on the cutting edge of representing American values for social justice for generations. Unfortunately, our state has crept away from its core values of reflecting the belief that we must care for those who may not be able to care for themselves without a little help. Currently, Kansans with developmental disabilities are forced to wait eight, nine, and even upwards of 10 years for the very services that allow them to live within their home communities, surrounded by their families and friends. These services oftentimes mean the difference between the ability to live an independent and productive life versus an unfulfilled life of struggle and despair. Unfortunately, America and Kansas have a long and cruel history of discrimination against people with disabilities. The atrocities and horrific conditions in large warehouses like Willowbrook remind us of the dark past where people with developmental disabilities went without services and were forced to wait. Nearly 50 years ago in places like Willowbrook, people were treated like prisoners and forced to wait for services in horrific conditions. Today in Kansas, people with developmental disabilities still feel like prisoners. Prisoners in their own home or in the homes of their parents as they wait on mile-long waiting lists for the same services that can make them productive members of our society and help them find a job. Edmund Burke famously said, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Unfortunately, in Kansas, we are repeating history by forcing people to wait for life-affirming services. The difference is where they are forced to wait. In 1995, the DD system in Kansas underwent reform that put our state in the forefront of service provision for persons with developmental disabilities nationally, making us the envy of DD professionals, advocates, and consumers. In the landmark Olmstead case, the Supreme Court determined that unnecessary institutionalization is discrimination. Olmstead requires that states provide services in the most inclusive setting, most appropriate to an individual's needs and desire. In Kansas, this typically means services in the home or community-based setting, not an institution. Um, in the last few years, uh, families have sons and daughters who are 18, 19, 25, 30, who are not getting the ability to live more independently in the community because that funding's not there. And um, it's almost disrespectful for them because they need certain supports to be able to be independent and they should be able to have those supports and live like we do in the community. The DD waiting list has skyrocketed over the course of the past decade. The last time the DD waiting list was effectively zero was 1997, immediately following the closure of Winfield State Hospital. In 2004, the waiting list was 515. In 2010, the list was more than 3,000. Today, the number is over 5,000. The waiting list is growing at an alarming pace with no end in sight and no effectively working plan established to address this crisis situation. When you go and ask for this help and you're told about these long waiting lists, it feels a little bit like your house is on fire and you've called 911 and they say, Sorry, there are 2,000 people in front of you. We're going to put you on hold. Best of luck. The DD waiting list has reached a crisis level. Waiting times can reach upwards of 10 years or more with no effectively working plan to address this crisis. We have confirmed reports of Kansans waiting for more than 10 years. The 2012 Kansas legislature appropriated enough money to remove 100 people from the waiting list. But at least 500 people, five times that number, accessed the system in 2012. At the current rate, waiting times could soon be 20 years or more. Kansas must develop and implement an effectively working plan to remove individuals off the DD waiting list at a reasonable pace. The most recent thoughtful legislative approach to planning was 
uh, probably six or seven years ago when the Legislative Budget Committee, uh, the highest ranking interim that looks at the budget for the state, said we need a three-year plan to eliminate the waiting list and to bring the wages of community uh, direct support professionals up to a livable standard. That legislative budget report made it into a piece of legislation that passed the House, but was never passed into law. Since then, some limited funding has been added to the budget for the DD waiver, but it has not kept pace with the need. The list continues to grow, and that multi-year plan that was a, a very well thought out approach to perhaps eliminating the waiting list for the first time since 1996 uh, was never pursued. And, uh, and that's what we need now. We need legislators to really take a fresh look at that concept and say, you know, we don't know if it's a, a three-year plan at this point, we don't know if it's a four-year plan, we don't know if it's a five-year plan, but we need a plan. The DD waiting list is in crisis, but the problem isn't so big that we can't fix it. All we need to do is come up with a multi-year plan that moves people off the waiting list and into services at a reasonable pace. And to do it in a way that we know we're several years down the road, we will eliminate the waiting list. It's going to take bold action, but it can be done incrementally over time. If we don't do it, we risk all kinds of things. We risk hurting Kansas families, continuing to depress the Kansas economy, and we risk the fact that Kansas will be in violation of different Supreme Court decisions like the Olmstead decision. Um, and it ensures that we can not only conform with the law, but more importantly, we can ensure that people have the services they need. If you say it must all be done this year, you're ignoring the sort of the practical realities of how, what it takes to help build a, a plan of care for a person with complex needs. We're from Georgia and we've lived in Wichita for a little over four years now and I love Wichita. Despite Angelina Vakarolinki's love for Kansas, she and her family, including her two autistic sons, faced unexpected challenges upon moving. Well, just like Kansas, Georgia had really great early uh, intervention services that both the boys got till they were three. But when those end, you really just kind of rely on the school system for services. And when Angelina decided to seek help from the state of Kansas, she realized it wouldn't be coming anytime soon. That even though we want our kids to be the best they can be, that uh, we're real happy with who they are. Um, God made them the way they are and he made them perfectly and we want them to, to reach their full potential, but um, we just want to enjoy them for who they are too. Angelina's younger autistic son, Oscar, is 10 years old. Four years pass without services that could help Oscar learn what he needs to become a contributor to society. And it really kind of just broke my heart because these are the years when his brain is still developing and he is so receptive to make those improvements. I feel like I'm a lot further ahead than what I could have been without the help that was given to me when I was growing up. Angelina's oldest autistic son, Aubrey, is now 18. Aubrey thrived with the help of home and community-based services funds he received in Georgia, something the family fears Oscar won't get to experience here in Kansas. He has a lot of skills. He just needs the right support to help him get there. But Oscar is falling behind while he continues to sit for years on the waiting list. Oscar waits with the 5,000 other Kansans in need of DD waiver services. That's going to be the difference between whether he's living in our basement for the rest of his adult life and on disability or whether he goes to college and maybe gets, you know, a job. Because the DD waiting list is in crisis, it forces families to be in crisis. Imagine you're the parent of an adult uh, with a developmental disability. Chances are you're forced to quit your job because you know your son or daughter is going to have to wait upwards of 10 years to clear the waiting list. Um, you're not paying taxes. You're not able to care for your family. You're not able to really provide for them. 
And so this crisis of the DD waiting list has put you in crisis and it worsens our fiscal crisis because that's less tax dollars coming into the state of Kansas because you're not able to have a job. You'd be amazed that what a job does for somebody because it, it focuses their life, uh, it uh, gives them something to look forward to, gives them something to, it gives them purpose in life. And um, the amount of money that we spend in this state for long-term care services versus employment, uh, you know, an, an example, our, our current system, every, every taxpayer in the state pays $108 per person for the system that we currently have to provide long-term supports for people. Uh, of that hundred and eight, a dollar fifty is spent on employment. A dollar fifty. It was rough because I actually stayed home for 10 years. I wasn't able to have a job. If DD waiver funding was available, more parents of children with disabilities could go to work full time, contributing millions of dollars to the Kansas economy. I know that waivers cost money. But um, the kind of waiver that we received for Aubrey probably didn't cost $10,000 a year. And because of those supports, I, I can't even calculate the money that, that's going to be saved over his lifetime and over my working lifetime. And, and you know, whenever you really talk about waiting, that's what a lot of people with disabilities do. They're waiting on a list. Then they're waiting for a bus. Then they're waiting for a job. Then they're waiting for a life. And people shouldn't have to wait for a life. The problem is about to explode, and I don't think people realize that. I'm, I'm Joshua Fleming. And how old are you? I'm, I'm 22. 23. Oh, 23. Josh's daily life and his future once looked brighter. With Josh's developmental disability, he needs constant supervision, something the family had help with until they moved to Kansas. And they told me they had come from Ohio and they had had great services there. And when they came here, nothing, basically. They had a five going on six year waiting list and their son was getting worse by, uh, by the week because he, uh, he was used to having a structured uh, type of environment, someplace to go, someplace to feel uh, useful. Um, and because he wasn't going any place, um, he was decompensating. I said we've never had to experience that before. We've always had where they came in, they said, you know, hey, Josh can come here. It's not going to be anything out of your pocket, you know, but his meals, and that's it. And we came here, and there was nothing to the point where we almost considered moving back. While Josh's dad works a full-time job, his mom can only work a part-time job because she must care for Josh. The family is only able to pay out-of-pocket costs for Josh's day services twice a week. This puts a huge financial strain on this family of four. My child is 23, but he's still my child. And he has a, the mind of maybe a, a nine-year-old. I will always have to take care of my child, unless I just throw up my hands and say, you know, I'm done. But who can do that to their child? No, I couldn't. You know, I don't think that a lot of times legislators have an idea what it, how, how debilitating this can be for a family, how much it can uh, um, control their finances and their uh, their freedom you know it, it is overwhelming at times and I think uh, they need to realize that uh, uh, that there's more to it than just money here the number of people with developmental disabilities who are receiving HCBS DD waiver services is around 8,000 people per month compared to 5,000 on the waiting list Roughly 1,700 of those on the DD waiting list are in the underserved category. What this means is those in the underserved category are not getting all of the services called for in their personal plans of care. We are reaching a breaking point as the number waiting approaches the number in services. Yep. Cool. 
13-year-old Alyssa used to think she could let her brother Josh live with her once she became an adult. She now realizes the complexity of dealing with his disability and she knows she can't take it on alone. I do realize that once they're gone, I'm gonna have to do something because you know, I don't want him just like going off and because he can't survive on his own. So I'm gonna have to help somehow. Come on, Josh, we need a spare. Come on, buddy. But I hope I see a state that finally uh, thinks about these kids. They're not even kids anymore. Some of them are 20, 30, and 40 years old. That they're human beings just like everybody else. They deserve to have the same Thing, opportunities that we have, you know, it's not his fault that he was brought into this world with a disability. The DD waiver has been chronically underfunded for decades. The state has not even kept pace with inflation, let alone the need, nor is the state funding enough waiting list spots to keep pace with the growth of the program. For many years, the legislature made a, a good effort to whittle down the size of the waiting list. And at two different times in the last 20 years, they brought it down to nearly zero. So we've grown from a waiting list of just one or 200 to now a waiting list in the thousands. We started learning about certain services that you had to be on waiting lists for and, you know, it was all very overwhelming at that time because you, you know, you don't understand what's going on. You don't know why your child is acting the way that they are. I think it was right before she was diagnosed. We knew something was wrong, but we just didn't know what was wrong. Julie is thankful that they got a good case manager, one who does not work for a managed care organization, and they eventually got Megan on the waiver. A long time passed before Megan left the waiting list. When it did, Megan qualified for supportive home care and respite. Up to that point, the family was quickly running out of resources. However, even as Megan and her family received some services, they were still left to wait for all of the services that were needed, according to her personal plan of care. Last we pulled her out of school, uh, and that kind of drained all of our retirement and everything, but we didn't know what else to do because she couldn't have been in a regular education school. Megan you know. received services via the DD waiver until she was 15 when she had a feeding tube installed and transitioned to the technology assisted waiver. You never know what's going on in the house next door to you and you don't see a lot of these kids out in public and so unless you are in a home or you're close to somebody that has a child, that needs these services, you just have absolutely no idea how important they are. I'm thankful for all the services that we get because most families don't get them. I mean, it's not much just help us speak it. And it's hard. Megan's younger sister, Mandy, says when her family couldn't get services, she felt trapped. It's like, you get home from something really fun and then something really serious is happening. Give me a smile. You think I'd be able to go like to your orchestra concert tomorrow if we didn't have services? No. Mm -mm. I probably wouldn't be able to go. Either I would be in uh, a mental institution probably if I didn't have services or she would have to be institutionalized because I wouldn't be able to care for her. Sometimes that'll make you smile when you get kisses. Julie says she's done nothing but love her child like parents do. She says she's done whatever she can for Megan, but she needed the assistance. She needed the help. From a budget standpoint, if those services aren't available, these kids are gonna end up being wards of the state. That's gonna cost a lot more money in the long run. Julie was fortunate enough to start her own business from home. She was somewhat successful amidst making sure Mandy was attended to around the clock. I'm still struggling really hard and I would probably qualify for food stamps or some other type of welfare. I choose not to go that route and um, because I know that there are other people that are out there that need it, but if, if my services were cut, I wouldn't have any other choice because there's no way I could work. I wouldn't be able to have an income. Julie felt isolated until Megan started getting services. She couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Funding allowed the family to have as normal of a life as possible. We've had her for almost seven years past what is considered 
old for that disease. And so I'm grateful for every day that I do have, but the toll that it takes on the families, it, it's emotionally, you know, one day we're doing well, the next day, you know, her oxygen level is low and we don't know what's wrong. We've talked about some things, some really tough things when hospice has been out. She'll get tears that run down her face. Megan began having complications and her family didn't think she'd survive past Christmas of 2011, but she did. Less than a year later, she died at home in November of 2012. So the, the individual crisis is on us right now. The state crisis uh, is the crisis that comes when you don't take care of the basic needs of the state. If we were talking about bridges collapsing, the state would respond immediately. Uh, it's, it's hard to understand why they cannot see the devastation affecting these lives as of an equally great crisis. But I think the solution is much more than just a few million more dollars for this service or that. I think we really need to look at a long-term plan of how do we address the needs of people and how do we address the needs of people efficiently and effectively. Richard, you are 19 years old. Richard graduated high school at 18 years old, just like most seniors his age would do. I should just look forward to graduating. Early in Richard's childhood, teachers suggested Richard get on medication. It didn't seem like anyone could figure out the proper diagnosis. We started researching the internet ourselves and we, we came up with the, with the possibility of Asperger's. So we tried to get with the doctor and she wouldn't even really help us at all to to get him tested and it was by the time he was eight years old before we you know him and I started doing our own research and it was when he was eight when we finally got a diagnosis but out here in southwest Kansas nobody had a clue as to what autism or Asperger's was. There was no assistance for the family until Richard started collecting Social Security when he turned 18. Once Richard graduated high school the family visited a residential setting for a tour. There was no way they could afford it for Richard without assistance. And what he saw was um, peers that were doing things like playing pool and um, talking and hey there, they find, find out, introduce him, find his name, and they were like, hi Richard, hi Richard, and he was so excited. He, was, he finally decided this is a place he wanted to be. That's where he wanted to be there and be on his own. And then we got where he was at on the waiting list. It's like, oh, well, that's not happening anytime soon. You have no idea how many parents do not understand that you're going to be on a waiting list. You may have to quit. Your school, the school stops. You don't have any, any place for your child to go for the morning, so you can work. You may lose your job because you don't have any place for your child to be. So they get by now with a small amount of waiver funding they finally began receiving after Richard turned 19. We had like $1,800 a month that we can use. These guys were more than happy to provide the day services that we needed. Um, then the problem was is dealing with him at nighttime because I can't, you know, at 19 I still can't leave him home alone. Richard used to be able to cook for himself, but since graduating high school he has regressed. He's capable of having a job, but he needs funding for employment training assistance. But the process of filling out an application and doing an interview and um, going to, getting up on time to get ready and go to work every day and being prepared without us step by step by step telling him what needs to be done the night before. Where do you live? I'm in a group home. Live in a group home, okay. Yes. He got, Eric got um, funding that there's money there and if the money were appropriated that we could do so many more things because there are people who are having to quit jobs because there's no longer funding. Waiting upwards of a decade for home and community-based services has a permanent negative effect on the lives of individuals with developmental disabilities and their families and it creates a much larger financial burden on the state's taxpayers in the long term. To me it's going to create a huge deficit in the state 
finances because the individuals are going to need so much more money by the time they finally get off the waiting list because their needs are going to be so much greater that if we would address them now, not seven years from now, we would be in so much better shape. Supports for individuals with developmental disabilities need to be individualized to the person's unique needs. This is not adult babysitting. This is about person-centered services to help the person with a disability be a full citizen in Kansas communities. Sue worries that when people with developmental disabilities are forced to wait for supports after graduating high school, all of the funding they received in the K-12 education system might be seen as wasted. They get out and as everyone knows, if they're not, if the education doesn't continue, then um, the level of learning starts regressing. Stephanie learned all she could about special education and services for Matthew. She wants to know he's going to end up being successful after high school. Because when I was reading that text message that said, congratulations, you got the funding, I just started crying because I know that he's going to be safe and it's going to be helpful to him and I don't have to worry about him anymore. It was, yeah, I mean... <laughs> It was a great feeling to know that, thank God, I don't have to worry about this anymore. Some of the things Matthew was doing with his time prior to receiving waiver funding could have resulted in legal trouble, which could follow Matthew for a lifetime. So the first person we found, DJ, was awesome. Matthew just loved him. It was just like, kind of like a big brother, but a, just a really good friend that was here after school for him. They, they go to the library, they'll go out and throw the football around. It's awesome. I really like who I get to hang out with. While Stephanie is at work, she can rest assured that Matthew is safe with DJ, something she can only afford through the waiver funding she received through the state. Well, it's extremely helpful to me. I know that there's other families out there that need it. Um, they need their kids or their adult kids to come off of this list so they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to feel the weight of the world on them all the time. Um, they want to see their kids just to grow and be successful too. Uh, I definitely believe that the government should be helping these individuals, um, a lot around them to take care of them. And it's a lot on the family. Um, it affects siblings, parents, I mean, and even extended family. DJ helps Matthew build the social skills he can use to interact and be a meaningful part of society throughout his adult life. Well, after I graduate from Simons and South next year, hopefully, well, actually not next year, but the year after, I'm going to be going to JUCO for college, getting my game degree, and then I'm going to become a game tester, and then I don't know after that. I want him to be able to get on his own feet and be able to take care of himself, but there's other things that I worry about. Where is he going to live? What's he going to do? Um, so he does need services for that. It wasn't until Morgan was in the sixth grade that Diana even became aware of funding available for her daughter. I truly take a calendar and look at when she's in school, when she's out of school, and really have to calculate the hours because it is such that we need absolutely every hour. And it's truly just to cover and to allow me to work. Respite services were critical for Diana when she traveled for work. For many parents, they do not have access to effective respite services. Yet with, you know, some one-on-one -on -one direction, she can make a contribution to society. As Morgan prepares to finish a post-graduation program through the Olathe School District, her mom, Diana, knows they're facing a big change. Although Morgan receives help with job coaching and attends community college, they don't know quite what the future holds. I'm in a position where I've worked full time in my current position for 22 years now. So in many ways, it's not an option to quit my job. I'm a single mom. We depend on, on my income. So taking those two things in 
into account that she's going to need someone with her full time. She cannot spend uh, time alone with her special needs and me needing to work full time. Where does she go? What does she do? What will make her happy? What will make her feel productive? Diana admits that she is fearful of a seven to 10 year wait that Morgan will face to receive services after her schooling is complete. I have this feeling she'll be living with me for quite a long time. But I also know nobody can predict the future. And if something happened to, to me tomorrow, she may need that type of support. She can do some things uh, and function in ways that other folks can't. Um, although she caught our frozen waffles almost on fire the other day while I was even home. So you just never know what moment to moment has to bring. So she does need supervision. Well, from a state's policy perspective, each year they choose not to address it deepens the crisis that they face when and if the federal government ever tells the state to get serious about keeping up with their obligations. And you know when these people who want to live at home um, are afforded the dignity and the freedom to live in their own homes, not only does it cost less than having them in an institution, but the people that are helping to provide the services, then they have a job and they pay taxes on the money that they earn. So it goes back into the economy. Well, my son Curtis was on the waiting list for 12 years. You're not allowed to put the kids on the waiting list until they're school age. So he wasn't put on the list till he was five. Rhonda Klein says she put her son Curtis on the waiting list and had a 10 minute visit once a year to reevaluate her son's needs. Nobody could really tell me where he was at on the list. And so you just waited. When Rhonda's income exceeded the limit for another grant the family previously qualified for called the Family Grant, she called to notify the state. When she didn't hear from the state for a couple of years following that, she became suspicious. And I think what might have happened was at that time they dropped him off the list for services also. Then it was back to step one. So I went back in and had to redo all the original paperwork to put him back on the list, which of course he went all the way to the bottom again. Yes, that's me. Rhonda asked Curtis's case manager on a regular basis exactly where he was on the waiting list. She said, well, let me fire off an email and find out. And uh, that was last summer, well, last May, right before he got out of school. And she said magically that he was gonna start receiving services the next month. Although Curtis waited 12 years for services, Rhonda says waiting just one year is too long. There was nobody, I, I was told that actual, to pay a respite care worker was $25 an hour. Now I don't know how many people could afford that for you know, an hour and a half, two hours a day, but I know that $50 a day really wasn't in my single parent budget. What they could afford was $50 a week with a child care provider where, as a 17 year old, Curtis was in the same care as infants and toddlers, just so Rhonda could work. As a parent, you're trying to learn all these processes from all these different agencies, trying to navigate them, negotiate them, find out what your child needs, everything from Social Security to Medicaid to, you know, getting waiver services for a child. And it's extremely confusing and it took me his whole life to figure out so far to figure out how to do some of these things. Is as we have increased our medical care and we've improved our medical care, people are living longer. And so people with developmental disabilities are living longer too. And so we've got to plan for longer lifespans. We've got to plan for retirement. What's going to happen to these people? They, they've been cared for at home. Now they're going to be institutionalized. This is happening now and every year we're going to see more and more of it. It may have been in the past that, that the problem seemed too big to find a solution. But I think the problem is too big to ignore 
pursuing a solution. Putting off addressing this waiting list crisis in Kansas is no longer an option. Kansas must move individuals off the waiting list at a reasonable pace with an effective multi-year plan. If you agree that all Kansans deserve the right to hope, freedom, and opportunity, regardless of disability, then please join the thousands of Kansans in speaking with one bold voice to make this a reality for all in our great state of Kansas. Are you ready? I have been waiting along with 5,000 other people like me in Kansas who have developmental disabilities to get help. It is heartbreaking to me. My friends and I need these services so that we can live a life that is hopeful and independent with opportunities, but we need these services now to help us get there. And many, many of us are on this long waiting list waiting list for our chance to have a better life. Please don't turn us away. Let us have a chance to speak for who we are and what we need to help us live as adults. Don't shut the doors in our faces. Please help, help us to be who we are meant to be. You can please join us to tell our government to fight for us. You can Join the campaign by calling, by going to www.einthewaitkansas.org. This video has been brought to you by the In the Wait campaign and was made possible through a generous grant from the Kansas Council on Developmental Disabilities. <laughs>